stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello everybody. Thanks and welcome again to Warriors for Christ podcast. Today I'm again joined by my good buddy, Sam. Sam. We're uh, we're gonna enter into the word uh, today, and Sam, what are we gonna talk about in this episode? Well, we're gonna continue Romans, and we're going to continue, and we're gonna look at Romans chapter three, possibly chapter four, and we already looked at the first two chapters about why was Paul made an apostle to bring about the obedience of faith. What is the gospel? What power does it contain? What righteousness is revealed in it? Who's the person that's condemned, but yet they believe in God, but they're condemned? Why is that? Uh, Who is the man that's justified? How is God going to judge us? What does it mean if you you think that you're a man of God, you believe, you proclaim the truth as taught, as dictated in the Word of God, or you think you do, you speak against sin, but yet you're still a slave of it in your heart? It's only a man who's been circumcised of heart who has a new heart. That's what we read. That man is blessed. But now we're going to go and talk about, well then, is there an advantage for the Jew? And what's the condition of every man born into the world? We're going to look at some of the deception, how some of the word of God is deceived and almost holds a man hostage to that former state. Yeah, Uh, you're talking about like the word being twisted, correct? So to to deceive men and the hold word them of God hostage. that's deceived and is not taken in, in proper context. So we're going to discuss some of that and um, shed light on it, God's light, Amen. His truth. Amen. Well, before we start, then I'll go ahead and pray, and at the end, when you feel so led, you go ahead and close out for us. Father in heaven. We're so thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for the blessings that you've given us in our life. We're especially thankful for the blessing of salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, Lord. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for this holy word and this session and this time together. We thank you for our listeners, Lord, who are out there. We thank you that uh, that they're able to understand that we're called to righteousness and that it's not a hard task. It's not a a hard walk because we're not walking it alone. We're walking it in spirit and in truth. And we, we pray, O oh Lord, that this time together and the word that we share lifts them up, carries them through uh, this tasteless world, helps them to be the salt and light you've called them to be, and that this word is it equips them with the full armor that they're able to uh, fight against the, the fiery darts that are thrown by Satan and, and his devils, Lord. We ask this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, Kyle, as we uh, continue here, we'll start with uh, Romans chapter 3. So we just got finished talking about um, uh, that the Jew isn't really a Jew who is one outwardly, but one who is inwardly. Uh, God talks about those who are descendants of Abraham are really those who are spiritual descendants of Abraham those who are sons of promise uh, of the Spirit. So, in here, in chapter 3, after it just almost says, well, then what's the point of being a Jew? Uh, what advantage is there? And that's kind of the question that's asked in chapter 3, verse 1. Well, then what's, what good is it? It seems like there's no advantage. Well, God does say that there was, um, there was an advantage. Uh, they were entrusted with something. They were entrusted with something that was very valuable. What does it say they were entrusted with in verse 2? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, even though the Jews believed in God from the context of, you know, as man just would say they believe, um, and it's even recorded in, in Scripture, right? Even when the, the Israel was led through uh, deliverance from Egypt, 
uh, and crossed the Red Sea. It says they all believed God, feared God, and praised God. But the problem is their unbelief or their belief did not profit them because the sin, it was counted to them as unbelief. Again, for people who don't know, go read the book of Hebrews and just look at chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Hebrews and look at how God explains it. So here in Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 3, he says, uh, basically the way they believed, even though they had a zeal for God and believed in God, God says that they didn't believe, that to them they had unbelief. Just because they didn't believe, Does it say that that nullifies God's faithfulness in verse 3? No. no. Well, I'll read it. What then, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? So God's faithful. Just because one person or a generation or whoever is unfaithful, that doesn't mean that God withholds his promise and does not let his promise extend to all other people. His promise extends to all mankind, independent of another man's choosing to believe or not believe or have true faith in God. Now, one of the things I want to point out here, you know, in, in chapter 3, I just want to go through some passages I feel are, are commonly misunderstood or taken out of context. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to look at Romans chapter 3, verse 9 uh, through verse 14. Okay. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. In the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's up to verse 18. Yep. So this says that um, all are under sin. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. Everyone is under sin. How many people does it say are righteous in verse 10? None. How many people does it say have any understanding of God? None. How many people does it say even seek God? None. How many people does it say does any good? Zip. Zilch. None. none. <laughs> what type of a tongue or a mouth does it say these people have? They have a tongue full of deceit and a poison of asps is under their lips. Deceit, bitterness, poison. Uh, these are all the things that as I recall, when I look at Peter or James, these are the people that the Bible would say are still of the wisdom of the world. Galatians, we read it. Still in darkness. Well, we know that everyone born into the world is born into darkness. We know that everyone that's born into the world, there's not a single one righteous. We know that everyone born into darkness, still in darkness, doesn't seek God. No one does any good. And they are filled with deceit in their mouth. The poison of a snake is what we've read about in the other books. Now, the problem is I've heard many people who call themselves a Christian leader. And they say, I'm a sinner just like you. We're all still sinners. Now, see, that's where the problem is. Does the word of God say that he allows you to remain in the condition that you are? Does he say he changes you into a new creation? I believe we get become a new creation. That's in the scripture. We can read and read that as it talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3 about the new creation. Ephesians chapter 4 
the new creation. Not the old man, a new man. But people falsely claim, well, I'm a sinner just like you. There's none righteous, no, not one. Well, yeah, the man that's still in darkness, the man that has no hope. Some of this is actually taken, uh, a good part of it is actually taken from Psalm. You know, the Bible talks about there's a such thing as a righteous man and an unrighteous man. We talked about the righteous man lives by faith. What does it mean? Well, let's look to Psalm chapter 14 that talks about the man who there's no one good, no one understands, versus the man who's righteous. And what does Psalm chapter 14 say? To get more context on the situation. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So as we look at those passages there, it sounds very familiar with what we just read in Romans chapter 3. Yep, very much direct quotations of portions there. Now we know everybody born in the world is born into darkness. Here, God's speaking to which person? In verse 1 of yeah. chapter 14. Yeah, the fool. The fool! Yeah. The fool! He's not speaking to somebody who's been born again. He's not speaking to somebody who's been transformed by the power of God. He's talking about the fool. Now, if Romans chapter 3 still applies to our life, then we're in great trouble. Because that means we're still in darkness. People who speak Romans chapter 3 as something that continues to testify of their life, they speak in ignorance. They, know, they don't know what they're speaking. They're actually speaking condemnation on themselves. But let me contrast that with a man that will dwell and abide in God's tent. The man that will dwell on God's holy hill. What does Psalm chapter 15 say? Read Psalm chapter 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord? He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. So the person that walks with integrity... The person that works righteousness. He has to work righteousness. Now, it's not his effort. I, I know the truth because I, I, I know the rest of the scripture. Someone who speaks truth in his heart. It all comes down to the heart. Do you have wicked thoughts in your heart? Does not slander with his tongue. There's no deceit in his tongue. Does he do any evil to his neighbor? None. It gets back to what does it mean to fulfill the law? Loves God with all his heart and with all. And, <laughs> and yet, people and his who himself. know nothing of God, they twist it to their own demise and deceive others. Psalm chapter 24 again talks about who will ascend to the hill of the Lord, who will stand in God's holy place. Well, who does he say in Psalm chapter 24? Verse 4 through 6. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. 
Amen. So again, we, we have uh, what truth is. Uh, God tells us what the truth is. You know, I, I look at other passages. I just reflect on different passages. I'm looking in Psalms. In Psalm chapter 25, verse 8, it says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. In chapter uh, 26 of Psalms, it says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord. Try me. Test my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. You know, again, you, you, you look at these and he describes uh, who are those that are blessed, uh, who are those that are not. Uh, I look at the uh, another passage, and it's also in Psalm, in Psalm 34. Uh, this is what's quoted in uh, Peter about who receives a blessing from God. If you want to look at who re receives a blessing from God, what does he say in Psalm 34, uh, talking about you know the fear of the Lord and, and desiring of life? Read uh, verse 11 through verse 16. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves lengths of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are for who? The righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. And the face of the Lord is against who? The wicked. The wicked. And so again, you see here, if you have deceit in your mouth... If you continue to do evil, you don't have a blessing. God is against you. His face is against you. You're still a wicked man. You aren't a righteous man. There's a clear contrast between the righteous man and the unrighteous man, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're born into the, earth, into the world as one man. We must cha be changed into the other by the power of God to escape the condemnation and the judgment and to have peace and fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with all the saints. You know, I, I, I find it ironic. Uh, uh, most all people, uh, most people can quote Psalm chapter 1. And I ask people, do you really know what you're saying when you quote Psalm chapter 1? It's talking about the man that's blessed. The man that's blessed does not walk in... In what? Verse 1. The counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The man that's blessed does not do those things. The man that's blessed does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Does not stand in the path of sinners. He doesn't do that. He doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. The person who does that is not blessed. But his delight is what? In the law of the Lord. How often does he meditate on God's law? Day and night. All we have to examine ourselves. What does our life look like? Do we have those things in our life? In verse 1? Well, if we have them in our life, how can we say we don't stand in them? We aren't blessed. And it's in the heart. It all comes down to the heart. Do we desire to meditate on God's law night and day? Well, then how do we think we're blessed? Does, do we yield fruit, the fruit of God? Or are we a wicked man, an unrighteous man? What happens to the unrighteousness? What happens to the wicked man in verse 4? The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. What will happen to the wicked in the, before judgment? The... 
Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You mean sinners don't get to stand in the assembly of righteous? But people say, but we're all sinners. You were a sinner. You formerly were in darkness. You formerly lived with the course of the world, the prince of power of the air, as sons of disobedience, indulging in the desires of the flesh. We read that in Ephesians. You used to live that way. Peter, you used to live that way. If we're still that person, we are not blessed. We're still in deception. We're still in darkness. We have to submit to God's truth. We have to stop and not believe the lies that are being taught. There is no peace. God talks about the false prophets and the false teachers. And Jeremiah, it says, he, they promised the people peace, peace, saying you have peace and safety with God when they only have destruction. He says, these people do not know my ways if they had stood in the counsel of the Lord and proclaimed my truth. They would lead my people to repentance. But instead, all their preaching does is strengthen the hands of the people that continue to do evil. It's terrible. Yeah. The Lord's word is truth. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. Tremble, do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Uh, again, you could go, I, I could go on and on and on and on and on. But we're going to go back to Romans. But I'm going to read these last four verses from Psalm chapter 7, verse 8 through verse 12. The Lord judges the people. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity that is in me. Now, he can say that because he received it from God. A man who receives a heart cannot boast. That heart came from God. The spirit came from God. It's not his. Let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous, God tries the hearts and the minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow, and he has made it ready. You see, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The New Testament talks about that. That's what the Bible commands us, old and new, repent and live. Come, get a new heart, get a new spirit. For why will you die, O man? God does not desire the death of the wicked, but rather that a man repents and lives. That's right. Obey my commandments. Abide in me. All of that. So, I think now we've covered enough context of what that passage means. Every man is born that way. But if you stay that way, you're condemned. It's true. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So, in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, it tells us that the law speaks to who? Those who are under the law. Those who are under the law. We know in other places, Scripture says that if you break the law, then you're under it. You ever hear of, if you break the law, then you can be punished by the law. If you don't break the law, if you aren't a lawbreaker, then you are not under the law. The law we're talking about here is not the law of man. Okay, I'm not talking about man's rules. I'm talking about God's rules. Are you a breaker of the law of God? And again, God looks at the heart. We know what murder is. We've covered it in earlier, earlier sessions. Uh, anger of man. Hate in the heart. Lust or adultery. It's desires in your heart if you see another woman. It's not the commit outward act. It's the inward in the heart, the desires. So 
someone who still breaks the law of God in their heart, they're under the law. To escape from being under the law that we read in other places, Galatians 5 comes to mind. I think it's, uh, what, verse 19 or 18, is the man led by the Spirit is not under the law. And if you continue to read in chapter 5, because the Spirit doesn't do anything contrary to the law. Therefore, it fulfills the law. Therefore, the man of the Spirit is not under the law. The law speaks to all those who are under the law, to the lawbreakers, to the rebellious, to the sinners. You still a sinner? You still an unrighteous? You still a lawbreaker? Then you're in trouble. But God has hope for you. God has a plan. His desire is for good. If we submit and come to him, we can be a partaker of his kindness. If not, then the wrath and indignation of God. That's what we're reading. So, if someone seeks to do works of the law, not a heart, it's not talking about the heart here, but works of the law, can that man be justified in verse 20? Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Correct. The law brings about the knowledge of sin. The law is there to show us and point us out that our lives reflect a nature contrary to God's nature. It reflects that we have a heart that's contrary to God's heart. We need a new heart. Until we have a new heart, if anyone seeks to live a godly life that wants to please God, wants to serve God, all they can do is try to conform to the law. All they can do is try to uh, abstain from wickedness and, and to live a holy, godly life. The problem is following works of the law or a law written down on tablets of stone can't change your heart. So as long as it remains something that's external, no man can be justified. But when it becomes internal, like what we looked at in Romans chapter 2, like the Gentiles who did not have the law, but the work of the law was shown, written in their hearts, those that have a circumcised heart, they can be doers of the, God, of the law. They are justified. They persevere in doing good. They receive eternal life. And as we continue to read, that same message is going to get repeated. But right now, he's contrasting... And talking, again, contrasting the Jew versus the Gentile, uh, that God's word is good, that no one is righteous before God. We're all born under, under sin, so man can't boast until we get out of it. Now, verse 21 gives us a little glimpse into that in verse 22. But again, he's not going to explain into detail all this until you get into, into you know chapter 5, 6, 7, 8. But what does he say about the righteousness of God in verse 21 and verse 22. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he's telling us, before God, everybody comes before God as a sinner. Everybody who's standing between b before the narrow gate or the wide gate that Jesus talks about, everyone's in darkness. Uh, you don't come into light until you pass the gate. Those who enter through the narrow gate is through faith, and God does something as the, in, through the entrance of that narrow gate. It's called being born again. Uh, and I'm going to hold off on talking about that because that's going to be discussed more in chapter 6. But the righteousness of God comes through faith in Christ Jesus. Don't try to interpret that statement right now. That statement right now. Wait and let God interpret it and tell us exactly what that means when we get into Romans chapter 6. But we already have indication of what that is looking at Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's a man who walks in godliness. A man who's a doer, not a hearer. A man who perseveres in doing good. A man who doesn't say, hey, don't steal, but then still steals. Or, hey, don't commit adultery, but still lusts in his heart. No, that, that, that's a man who blasphemes God's word, who's deceived. So we can't use man's word to define that statement. 
But people love to take that statement and they love Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, of course. He's just establishing that there's no one righteous before God. We already established that. The question is, do we remain in that position? And is it a change of lifestyle or is it just some uh, rubber stamp that now all of a sudden God sees you completely differently uh, even though there is no life change, no heart change? Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that there are two laws. There are two laws. There's works of the law, which no man can be justified, but there's another law. What is the other law that's discussed in verse 27? Is the law of faith. Why, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. So what he just finished going through from Romans chapter uh, verse tw 23 on is that there's no one righteous before God. All are sinners. Uh, nothing can make you righteous before God. There's nothing you can do. There's no, uh, you know, trying to do good that can change your heart. Being changed is not a work of the law. Being changed into a new creation is, is through faith. It's a law of faith. You cannot receive the ability to walk in the righteousness of God by seeking on your own effort to follow God's commands. Uh, that's not God's righteousness. That's your effort. But when you come in faith to God through a law of faith and you receive of the righteousness of God through faith, the Spirit of God, which is also called the gift of righteousness, we'll learn in Romans chapter 5, you're now able to be a doer of the law. You're now able to walk and abide in righteousness. You're now able to keep the commandments of God that was discussed in the Old Testament and New Testament. It's by faith. Not only does he say it's by faith, we know that only faith can change a man's heart, but also, is God just a God of Jews only? No. What does he say in verse 29? You ask the question, I'll read the whole verse. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. So we know that God justifies both. And we know that it comes through faith. A man who is truly of a faith, a faith that can save, has a proof of faith, is a doer of the law. A man who has a proof of faith overcomes in trials and temptations that we read in James. A man who, is a do, uh, who has a proof of faith is a doer and perseveres in doing good. He receives eternal life. So now that faith has come, do we nullify the law in verse 31? Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. We establish the law. You see, a man who doesn't have faith can never meet the requirements of the law. A man who's of faith establishes the law, fulfills the law, is able to love his neighbor as himself, does not break the law, because the Spirit of God does not lead a person to transgress against the commands of God. See, now we're starting to get more at the deeper, deeper truths of Scripture. And, and that's, you know, Romans chapter 1 and 2 really gets a, a, a brief introduction, and then chapter 2 talked about the practical application. In contrast, the man who truly knows God versus the man who says he is but is a hypocrite. Uh, all the hypocrite Christians that really aren't of God but, but serve the devil. And now we're talking about the state of man that no one's righteous, but it's a gift of God. And that it's by a law of faith, not of works. But now we're understanding what a true law of faith is. It does not nullify the law. It fulfills the law. So we're probably going to wrap up there. But looking forward, chapter 4 is then again going to contrast and say how we have, uh, how did this faith come? Did the faith come through works of the law or does the faith come through a promise of God? Oh. And, and do we accurately take the verses from Romans chapter 4 or do we misapply them? And that's what chapter 4 gets into. All right, you know, Kyle, I, I think rather we're going to continue. Uh, I think, you know, we still have time, and I feel led to just continue and tie chapter 4 in with, with chapter 3. Uh, so we're going to continue to move forward. So we just talked about in chapter 3, again, about uh, that old man, uh, the man that's of sin, 
uh, that is not received to the righteousness of God through faith. But now we're going to talk about this faith and, and where does faith come from? See, Romans is very methodical as it works through it. Chapter 4 is now going to talk about, well, where does faith come from? Does faith come from a promise of God? Or does faith come from something that we earn or we work for? Uh, did How did Abraham receive the promise of faith? So that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to see what God says about it. And it's, it's somewhat consistent with Galatians. Galatians, I feel, gives an even better explanation of this. Uh, when you go and you look through uh, Galatians chapters 2 through 4, um, I would say that that probably is, is an even better, more comprehensive. But this is good, too, because it as you keep going, you put all the chapters together of Romans. Amen. So in chapter 4, it's asking a question. What is the question that's being asked in chapter 4? What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? All right. Now, if you notice, each time when we go into these different places, it asks a question. There's always a question. The question is driving at what really is the truth. So the, the point, one of the points here in chapter 4 that we're looking at that, that's getting ready to address, the very first question asked is, what did Abraham find? Did Abraham find something according to the flesh? No. Mm -mm. It's not according to the flesh. It's not something that he did on his own. It's not something he received by his own effort. No. No. And, and when it talks about being found, it's like this promise, this, this faith. Well, what was it? And in, in verse 2, what does he say about Abraham and, and being justified? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. All right, so now this faith credited as righteousness. Again, he doesn't explain exactly what that means, but we know that it can only come through faith. We know that an ungodly man cannot justify himself. We know that an ungodly can man cannot change the state that he's in. Uh, a man born in darkness remains in darkness. A, a sinner is a sinner till the day he dies, unless God changes him. That can only happen through faith. Now notice in verse 2 it says, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast. Now the works they're talking about, as they looked at previously, is works of the law. Works of the law, that's man's effort. Man can boast in that. Abraham can't boast. Now, we know when we looked at James chapter 2 and a couple episodes ago, it discussed that Abraham was justified by works. Now, we know there's a difference. That works was a work of faith. This works is not a works, work of faith. It's works of the law. Correct. So you have to discern between the two different types of works. He's not speaking about the same works. There is a difference. So right now what he's contrasting is how did Abraham receive a blessing of God? When God made the statement and Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, what, was that statement made based upon Abraham's efforts? Or is it made, and we also know now that it was a statement of prophecy, <laughs> it was made of a statement of pro prophecy looking forward to the faith that Abraham would have and the faith that would be perfected through works of faith. That's right. And that was the, at least two episodes ago. Correct. So that's the more comprehensive. Now, again, right now, he's just making the argument of it has nothing to do with us. Well, yeah, I agree. It's, it's all about God. It's God does a work. But making sure we understand and we don't apply too much or take it out of context of what that statement uh, is meant. So as you continue to look in chapter 4, he points out another thing. Again, how is the blessing received? Uh, was it something that Abraham earned? No. No, you can't earn it. It's only through faith. So in verse 9, he again is going to give another example uh, to try to explain 
how this blessing comes. And he's going to say, does the blessing, what's the question? Another question in verse 9. All right. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Correct. Now, one of the reasons why God made that promise, remember, it was a prophecy, it was a statement of prophecy in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, was to take away any argument that people could try to use to say that Abraham was earning something. So it was specifically declared in advance as a statement of prophecy to Abraham before he ever even received circumcision. God knew that the Jews were going to try to try to take circumcision and turn it into some physical requirement. God knew that. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things. He has foreknowledge. He's able to see the future before it happens. So God, knowing that, made the statement in advance, probably several other reasons that uh, I know at least those, those are some of them, so that people couldn't distort and twist his plans. So it was credited, it was, the statement was made to Abraham while Abraham was still uncircumcised. You can go back and read it. Genesis chapter 15, he had not yet received the commandment of circumcision. That didn't come until later in chapter 17, after he initially doubted God, but then was rebuked and apparently didn't doubt anymore. Then he received the sign of circumcision. Well, imagine that, because now it says he received the circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. That's in verse 11. And in verse 12, that he would be the father of circumcision to not only to those who are of the circumcision, or the Jews, but also who follow in the steps of of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while well, uncircumcised. And so, again, this is all getting into, it's not about our effort. It's not about our effort. It's a belief and a faith in God. But it has to be a belief in his truth and believing that God can accomplish an impossible work. As Abraham, when his faith was perfected, was fully convinced and was willing to sacrifice his son, as it says in James. And prophecy was then fulfilled. So based upon that, it all comes down to the promise in being made heirs. Is that promise in being heirs of God, is it through the law or is it through faith? But notice he just doesn't say faith, it's something of faith. What does verse 13 say? For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of faith. Again, it really hasn't gone into depth of what does this mean, righteousness of faith yet, but it will. The end of chapter 5 uh, ends with that statement that grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then in chapter 6, 7, and 8, it tells us what that means. What does it mean for grace to reign through righteousness to eternal life? It gives us examples and application. But for now, it's just a statement. So we have to continue to hold that thought, that question. But again, the argument being made in chapter 4 is not about that, and not about defining what the details of the result of that is, but how you receive the promise. The promise is received through faith not works of the law. Another reason why it's by faith, in verse 16, and also called as grace, is for what reason in verse 16? For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So again, getting back to faith, it's not about works of the law. Now, those who uh, were brought up under the law, the Jews, uh, they're still allowed to be partakers of faith, just as those who were not brought up under the law. The law does not lead us to Christ. The law points out and reveals that we're sinners, as we read earlier in Romans chapter 3. 
So the law does not change us. It simply exposes the fact that we're sinners. Only faith can change us if we receive the gift of righteousness. That's discussed in Romans chapter 5. And it has a perfect result that's discussed in Romans chapter 6. That was also kind of alluded to when we read James, the book of James. So then he goes and he talks about the faith that Abraham had. And we already talked about this in uh, an earlier episode when we uh, discussed James chapter 2. And we actually looked more in depth at the faith of Abraham. Um, that that statement was a prophecy that he actually doubted God. He didn't believe in God um, in, in the promise of his seed. And he initially said, no, 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 let it be Ishmael. Right? And then God rebuked him and he stopped laughing and stopped doubting and, and trusted in God. And at that point, he became fully assured. And that happened later when he was 100 years old. Therefore, it was credited him as righteousness. And so again, the whole argument here in chapter 4 really comes down to how do we receive the promise of God? How do we receive the inheritance? How do we become an heir of God? It's not through man's effort. It's not through the boast of man or the works of man. It's only through faith in God. Now that we have that laid aside, now chapter 5 sets us up to explain when we do receive the righteousness of God through faith what the power of God does in a man's life. And so with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and, and close in prayer here. And when we pick up again, we'll go into Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. Okay, sounds good. So Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you that uh, it's not about our effort or our works, uh, because we know that we're born into the world as sinners, uh, that we have corrupt hearts, we have evil thoughts that defile us but that you're able to change a man. You're able to circumcise our heart. That through faith, we can become partakers of the Holy Spirit of promise. We can be changed into a new creation. And we can live and walk in holiness and righteousness and abide in light. And with you, O God, and with your Son, Jesus Christ, and with all the saints. Father, bless your word. And I just pray that you open the eyes and you teach by your Spirit, O God, the deep treasures in your word the life-changing power of your gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, listeners, for joining us. Uh, we hope that you found this very helpful. Uh, if you felt led to, please share uh, this program with your friends and family. Um, we, we hope that it edifies them as well. And we're so thankful that you're out there and you're listening. Amen. Have a great day. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.